All right, welcome back to Five Minutes on K-12 Online Learning, our last edition of this initial series. Uh, and today our with is Dr. Rick Furtick. So Rick, can you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, thank you so much for uh, doing these. Uh, it's been really, really interesting to watch our teachers, our teacher educators um, deal with this pandemic and try to understand teaching what it looks like. So thank you so much for, for hosting me. So my name is Rick Furtig. I'm the Summit Professor of Learning Technologies at Kent State University. Uh, I study uh, K-12 online education as well as the use of innovative technologies across the lifespan, uh, ranging from you know augmented virtual reality uh, to mobile learning and then in medicine, K-12, uh, you know, informal learning, uh, kind of across the, across the range. All right. So as you mentioned, Rick, you know, we've got these folks that have been transitioning now to this remote teaching option um, as this pandemic has uh, hit us. And in most jurisdictions, they're anywhere from three to six weeks into this. So some of the teachers are starting to get at least a little bit comfortable with maybe a couple of the tools now or are starting to get a bit of a routine put in place. But a lot of them still have to keep doing this until really the end of June in some jurisdictions. Um, what advice would you have for them as they continue down this journey and um, to the end of the school year? Yeah. So having watched, uh, not necessarily all 27 of your episodes, but having watched many of your episodes, I know there's been a lot of really, really good advice. So I'll, I'll do my best not to replicate some of the good advice that's already been given. And as you've said, I mean, teachers are now, uh, at least in Ohio, have been told that, yeah, this is over for the year. And, you know, obviously they're making plans for, uh, for what's going to happen in the fall. Uh, so there's a, a couple of pieces of advice that I would give. Um, first one is actually something you know a lot about, which is uh, the ability to study abroad. And I think one of the things that we know when people study or work abroad is they kind of go through this little bit of a roller coaster ride, right? So maybe they're going to go study in Italy and they have kind of this initial real excitement for it. And then they've been there for four or five weeks or six weeks and they have like a little bit of a wait a minute, this isn't home. And then they kind of even back out and they start to see the, the best of, you know, kind of what, what's there and also what's at home. And my guess is now, you know, maybe the exact isn't true here because people didn't go into COVID and pandemic really excited about online learning, right? Uh, but, but this idea is that they've been in it for four or five weeks and, and, and hopefully um, many people were prepared to do this, many weren't. And, and my guess is a lot of that weren't prepared to do this are actually starting to see some really cool things about online and blended instruction. Uh, you know, for instance, we know from the research that if a teacher asks a question face to face, maybe there's two or three students going on uh, or answer and then they move on to the next question or the next topic. And, and you can't really do that online. Right. And so so teachers will say, well, I, I'm sure I'll, I won't be able to get my to know my students as well online as I did face to face. And what they're all of a sudden realizing is that to show up like all the kids show up, it's not just physically showing up, it's responding. And so a lot of teachers are, are coming to know their their students uh, actually better than they thought they would in, and be maybe even better than what they did in the face-to-face -face environments. So, so they're starting to see some really good things. Um, and, and so as they continue on and, and then as they transition back to face-to-face, to -face, hopefully in the fall, is to maybe understand that it doesn't have to be an all or nothing. I think you know this well that for a long time there was a little bit of a, of a, you know, us versus them in, you know, versus like charter versus, you know, traditional ed or online versus traditional ed. It doesn't have to be us versus them. There's positive things that are going to come out of, of online instruction. But there's also good things that happen in face-to-face -face instruction. So to realize that, you know, you can have the best of both worlds. I think, I think that's point number one. Point number two is, you know, it's kind of like when you first move out of your parents' home and you, you know, you move into college and you learn how to cook hot dogs and, and, you know, uh, ramen. And, and then over time, you know, you start to realize you can explore some other things. And, and for a lot of teachers, they've been just hanging on right now, right, to get to get their feet wet, to make sure everybody's okay. And, and so now what they're doing is they're getting into some more advanced things is to be able to, uh, to do just that, to explore, to try new ideas. Now, that could be over the course of the next couple of weeks, that could be over uh, professional development in the summer. But, but, but stretch your wings a little bit and try some new things. Well, how can they best do that? Well, one is there's a, a tremendous amount of online uh, professional development. Your uh, webinars here are a great example of that. 
Uh, there are communities that have put together where teachers can get with other teachers and connect and find out what works and what doesn't work. Uh, uh, being able to try out new pieces of software and say, well, this might work, this might not work. So just getting themselves immersed either now or over the summer as they prepare. Uh, again, to, to, to go into fall knowing that if this happens again, that they, they've made it and they're doing well and they can kind of keep, keep working on that. The, the final piece of advice that I would give them uh, and again, I could go on for hours about this advice, but uh, there's a lot of uh, schools that have been prepared for this, a lot of teachers that have been prepared for this. And I feel like they've done a really good job of instructing. Uh, but they haven't, not all schools have done a great job of understanding students' well, well-being and, and mindfulness and mental attitude towards this whole thing. They haven't done a, as good enough a job of checking in. They've been caught up in worrying about content acquisition, which they understand why. But checking in with kids, I mean, kids are, are struggling right now, right? I mean, you know, they've never done this before, right? Most of them have never done this before. The teachers have never done this before. The kids are at home with parents who may be home and may be scared because of losing a loss of job or whatever. So checking in with kids and making sure. And then for the districts or for the administrators, making sure that they're checking in on the well-being of their teachers because teachers are struggling as well. They're, they're used to seeing their kids. They're used to having social interaction with other teachers. So making sure that they're, they're keeping themselves well and keeping their kids well. Very good. Now, Rick, I know you're a parent yourself and you've got a couple of young fellows there that you're having to, to help with this and, and you being, you know, having expertise in the field and stuff. I know that you're probably trying to, to juggle work and, and supporting them and, and in much the same way that we've got a lot of parents that are doing that right now. And, um, many of the parents are probably starting to get into a bit of a routine, but it's probably not as, as set or an established a routine as what the teachers have gotten in because of all of the competing demands. What's some advice that, that you could give to, to folks that are trying to figure out how they can best support their kids in this kind of environment? Yeah, that's that's really, really great question. And again, I, I haven't seen as many school districts do a good job of engaging with parents and saying this is kind of how we want you to become involved so you know we can say things to uh, teachers like you know hey make sure you you engage you know check out uh, or, or examine your pedagogy and make sure you're not just trying to transition face-to-face -face learning online look at best practices of what virtual schools have done for a while and what we already know of blended programs you know make sure you have a schedule and stick to a routine check in with your folks like there's always this advice that we give to teachers, but a lot of it, again, does involve, you know, the student's well-being or what the role of the parents are. And so, as, as you mentioned, as a parent, it's very, very easy to get over-involved. And I think some of the work that Eric Black did out at the University of Florida and recognizing that, you know, if parents got engaged to the point that they were instructing their kids, the kids actually did significantly worse, where if parents played a role where they were supportive, uh, they helped communicate with the, with the instructor, with the teacher, uh, if they helped the students set up routines and get organized, that's when the parents were at their sweet spot. And I think it's, it's, it's teachers are still trying to figure out how much instruction to give, how much content to give, how much homework to give, how much screen time to give, how much face-to-face -face asynchronous or synchronous screen time to give. And so you know, parents are trying to figure out this out as well. And if parents spend too much time engaging in that and not communicating because they're trying to be that teacher, the teachers aren't necessarily getting the kind of feedback they need about what students are struggling with or what they're not struggling with, uh, areas they need support or not. So I would say, again, for the teachers, um, set up expectations for kids and for parents. If I go and you're my teacher and I see you every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, face-to-face -face from 940 to 1020, and I know that my homework's due every Friday, and I know that I can email you five questions. Okay, great. But now we're online. So what does that mean? Am I still seeing you at the same times? Am I, is my homework still due at the same time? When can I email you? When can I not email you? So helping students understand that, those expectations. And then for parents, helping them and communicating with them and saying, look, you know, this is what we're doing this week with your child. This is what our expectations are for you. And if you find yourself doing copious amounts of teaching beyond what you would normally do when your kids were just asking you for help with homework. And there might be something else going on and you need to communicate that with me. And parents should have every 
um, I, I would say, dare say, expect, <laughs> expectation that it's okay to contact the teacher and say, hey, we might be doing something wrong because, you know, Owen has been online for 14 hours today <laughs> and you gave one assignment or something like that. Very good. Um, I'll make sure to include, because if I remember, Eric's work is actually published in open access stuff. So I'll make sure to include that in the uh, kind of the, the details below, a link to that so that parents can access that. So thank you very much, Rick. This has been very useful. And um, so can this I, has been... One more, one more quick thing? Oh, sure. Just to, to all the teachers that are out there, uh, you know, we've, we've, uh, history repeat. I mean, I'm very ecclesiastical about these things. History repeats itself. And so there's nuances what we're doing where, you know, yes, we've never taught like this in the pandemic or been completely online. But the reality is, is there are some good practices that uh, that we know work in online and blended situations. And so to continue to try to learn from others is a good thing. But at the end of the day, we just got to thank our teachers because they are being asked to do uh, <laughs> a job that um, they, they weren't essentially told that they were going to have to do and in most cases weren't prepared to do. If you look around teacher education, you know this well, you've written on this, you've talked about this, you know, schools across the country don't prepare future teachers for teaching in online and blended circumstances. So to all teachers out there, thank you. And that's a wonderful note to end on. So this has been another edition of Five Minutes on K-12 Online Learning With. And today our with was Dr. Rick Ferdig. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Thank you.